All right, recording in progress. So I was, we were talking in the in the Brady Bunch uh, Discord for a while back about Atlas and how we all made it here. And it kind of struck me how much awesome stuff that Atlas does. And I kind of wish that there was something I could do to, to like, you know, give back. And I've realized that like all of that time I spent programming put me in a pretty unique position to be able to jump on this. So I'm sure there are people who do this sort of uh, scripting a lot better than me, but um, I, I think that being, uh, being a programmer definitely helped me jump into it really quickly. Um, but do you guys see my screen? Yep. All right, do you see my cursor? Does that show up? I see a pencil. Good, okay. Um, let me pull up Stock Hacker. So what I wanna talk about is, is both um, scripting for scanners as well as indicators because they're basically the same thing. Um, and if you, if you can write an indicator for something, you can write a scanner. Um, and that's, it's just, a, it's, it's how you approach it and how you think about it conceptually. Um, a scanner is a yes or no question. You're asking a yes or no question and it will, it will pop up a list of all of the things that, that say yes. Um, and unfortunately, see, I don't know how this works. Like when you just open up your, your scanner and all I did was I hit de uh, detach and it pops it up for you in a separate window, um, which makes it handy to have lots of things going on at once. Um, I don't know what their default time range is when you just say, give me a percent change of 5%, like for, for what, for how long? I mean, it, when I scan this, it gives me about 1500 stocks, which seems like a lot. Um, but I have no idea, like whether that's a, on a, on a daily, like 5% or whether it's a one minute 5%, like that sort of thing sketches me out. So I, I, tr I, I tend not to use this sort of, um, metric very much. I mean, you could just add filter stock and then, you know, add more here if you wanted to. And I do that for, for some things I'll, I'll sometimes I'll put the, the, like the close, um, if I want to do a min max, but I also do that in the code just so it's all in one place. Um, but at the very root of it, like, so if you create a new scan or start with a, a, an existing scanner right now, this will scan for, I don't even know what, let's see if it even scans anything. Yeah, this is, uh, so 16,150 stocks. So that's how many stocks we have, um, total that we can expect. So any number smaller than that, I think we've, we've done a good job. Um, so what, when it, admit so when that when you when you start adding adding filters um one of the things you can do is is add a, a custom filter um and the, all, all that is is if you just create a, a study it'll drop in this default one but you can go down to custom so this is this is where it starts getting into the custom stuff if you want to write a custom one um you can go to custom and then it will pop up this editor um, so this isn't all that helpful. You can edit it from here. The, the cool thing about this is if you do edit it, you can go in here down to um, study. And if you have any studies that you've written, you can pick them here and just use whatever plot you're, you're pulling out of that as the study. And then, you know, this is kind of a visual way of setting these things up. So if you say um, the, you know, three bar play um, and the offset is, is just, um, whether it's forward or backwards in time on the candles. Um, so whether it hits and then alerts at a separate time. Um, so this, it shows automatically, it shows what plots are in there. I have two plots. You have to pick one because a scanner can only work off of a single plot. Um, and I don't even know what this is going to do, but um, you can then set it as, as different, like crosses above, you know, values, a different study, you know, all kinds of, you know, whether it's above a price. I mean, at the end of the day, this is, this is that question we're asking uh, yes or no question. Does, this condition do this um, other condition, you know, so it, it's just a matter of figuring out like how you want to, how you want to set those up. So let's just pick a random thing um, and then save it so we can see. So, so it's written this out for us um, and it's, it's got a, it, it's, it's referencing the original study and then it's referencing that plot within the study. And then it's saying crosses above close. So this is kind of an English language, you know, seems really easy. Um, and it'll, it'll do something, but that's not really all that great if you've got a custom scan that you want to be able to, to dig into. Um, so what I've been doing is getting into, um, when I edit it, I'll just jump right into the ThinkScript editor. And then this, 
this is where I do most of my work right here. Um, it's got all of this cool stuff on the side here that will, um, this is this is kind of a, an overview of all of their API that you can dig through. A lot of this stuff doesn't make sense to me. Um, some of it does though. I mean, I use average a lot. Um, and then when you click on it, it, it shows you the um, quick reference here. It's better online. They have more things and more examples online um, at, their, at their website. Um, but this this basic thing like this is that question so this adx crossover is a yes or no question it's going to return either true or false um i don't think it does out of the box do anything um but at the at the very basic you can go um plot you have to name it plot is uh um the default for if if it's uh it's an output so you say plot and then you have to give it a name we'll just call it scan this can be whatever you want um you, you need that as a as a reference for later plot scan equals close um and then that's it so this doesn't really do anything but this gives it um what you want it to do like that we're we're going to be looking for a yes or no value um or or a number i mean that's the other thing you can look for if it's uh above something close above uh whatever ten dollars um and then we named it scan so that it it will pick that up and then use the answer of that to plot things. Um, and then anything with a close above $10. So if we hit OK, you can see that our custom study is in here. We don't have anything else set. So if we just hit scan right now, this D tells us that it's going to be running that on a daily. Um, we could run it on a, on a shorter, you know, anything above $10 and a shorter. But we're still looking at like 7,200 stocks that it returns. So that's how many stocks are above $10. So that's our scan. I mean, that's that's really all it is. So if you're if you're given a scan that says plot close, um, which is just the close price is greater than 10. And you're like, well, I want to, I want it to be, you know, on the, on the 10 minute chart. And I want it to be, um, you know, you hit the little edit pencil here, it'll pop up that thing again. And then you can go into the editor and say, make it whatever you want, $11, you know, and then it'll, it'll set that for you, um, which is fine. But if you don't really know what else you're doing, then you kind of have to spend a little bit more time with it, trying to figure it out. And if you try to scan for something and it gives you 7,000 results, um, you, you've got to have ways of narrowing that down a little bit. Um, so I guess before I go too much further, has anybody here done any programming before? Or are you guys all pretty much just full-time trading or working at Chuck E. Cheese? <laughs> Hang on. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, oh do I use exclude? Yeah, I need to look at the see the thing on the top. I don't know if you use exclude. Um, yeah, I, I actually do. One of the things that I exclude, I have a list of all um, warrants that I went through and compiled, and I exclude those because. I don't I don't like results with W in the at, at the end. So yeah, um right. and, and it's kind of nice. And then scan in all stocks rather than everything. I mean, that's that's the other thing I, I I tend to like, you know, sometimes I'll intersect with specific watch lists that I've created, but I generally, yeah, I mean, I only exclude things like warrants. And and I've also got there's like some I found out there's like test um tickers that that Nasdaq puts out there. It's like ZZ XT something or other. And that was annoying. So I added it to my exclude list. Um, so yeah, I definitely do. Um, the only, I used to do Oracle DBA. I know select statement, stuff like that. Oh yeah. Okay. So, I mean, it's, it's 20 some years ago. It's not too different from that. I mean, what we're, what we're doing is, is um, it, it's basically just following, following the logic. Um, so I guess the, the, the first thing I, I want to do before we get too far into the, to the scanners is talk about, um, there's more people. Um, I want to, I want to talk about indicators because like I said, if you can create an indicator for something, you can create a scan and this is indicators are how I debug my scans because a lot of times I'll, I'll, I want to scan for something specific in a ticker. Like, you know, Hey, this bar looks really big. I want to see how many, um, you know, how many, uh, how many stocks have 5% pops, uh, within the last five minutes, but this doesn't have one in the last five minutes. And I don't know how to, to debug that without, you know, going into uh, and creating a, a custom indicator that will that will also like show on a plot, it'll show a result. Um, and then I know that the logic is sound and I can then drop that into a scanner and then refine it from there. Um, so the way you can do that is just go in and create a new study. So if you go into your, your studies, it's the little uh, beaker icon. Um, in here, one of, the, one of the options is to create. So if you just hit new uh, or hit create, it will um, pop up a new 
script window, which you can, you know, it'll hopefully give you new study zero. It'll tell you already plot data equals close. And this is really nice because you have a fully, you know, th there's your study. You can hit OK, hit apply. Now your study shows up. Um, and you can see that it's not a very useful study. It just plots the close on the, the I mean, it's just the close value with a simple line, um, which, you know, who cares? Uh, but it's it shows you how it works. And so now you can start editing it from there. So if you go into your beaker again um, in the studies, you can you can actually just click on this uh, little script icon here and it will let you open it up. Why is this so slow? Oh, it's just tiny. I wonder what happened there. Um, so from here, they, you can start you can start actually trying to, to plot something more useful. Like if we wanted to see if there was like a 5% um, pop in in one of these, we can we can plot just those and then be able to see that. So you could say um, if whatever, um, let's see, how would we we could go? Um, so plot data. This is just the name of of our our um, scan. It can be whatever you want. Data X doesn't really matter, um, and it and it shows up red right now because it's got an invalid statement, and that's not really all that helpful unless you know that what's wrong with it. Um, I had opened a parentheses but didn't close it. And so it's telling me that there's just something wrong with that line. Um, so once I fix it, then that error goes away. But it's dumb things too, like if you don't put a semicolon at the end, um, because that's how it knows that it ends the statement. Because you can do cool things like this, where if you want to start your parentheses on one line, you can dump it on another line, and it's still valid. <clears throat> so you can, um, and I do this all the time where it's, you know, just so that I can, I can um, set different, uh, different conditions really easily and then comment them out if I want to. And you can comment something just by putting a little um, shift three hashtag, um, which is pretty easy. Um, although it invalidates my statement. So plot close. So what we want is anything that's um, close minus open divided by close. So this is going to give us um, a percentage. And if that percentage is greater than, say, 0 0.03, uh, so like 3%, then we want it to plot. So we hit we hit OK, and then uh, hopefully it'll show us something. And if it doesn't, we have to go figure out why. Um, so it didn't show us anything here, even though we know that some of these bars have to be like bigger than that. Um, but and it turns out that it's because what we did was we asked a yes or no question and we got a yes or no answer. So if you look down here at zero, you see these little peaks here are at about one, right? So that's that's basically true false. Um, what that means is that we got an answer, but we didn't get it where we expected to get it. So it showed up off the off the chart down here. It's true false answer uh, because everything is going to be a number at the end of the day. These are like every single variable resolves to a number, or it can also be a list of numbers. Uh, we'll get into that later. Um, but what we want to do is display this in a way that we can actually use it as an indicator. So if we go back into our script um, from here, you can. Open it up again, and I spent hours doing this. Just you know, up, down, up, down. Um, but one of the things you can do with a plot is to because this is a this is a true or false statement, right? So it's saying either zero or one, and then that's how it plots it as a zero or a one, which for a scan is perfect. So if we wanted to scan this, um, you know, right now you could copy this into a into a scan um, and then run it, and it would show you any any current bars where the where the bar body height is greater than 0.03. You can also, um, instead of close minus open, you can do body height, but that doesn't tell you whether it's a bullish or bearish bar. And I, when I just want to look at the, um, you know, a one one direction here. Um, so what you can what you can do is is added a, a conditional statement, um, and and you can see here that like these are built-in variables, right? Close, open, high, low volume those are all built in and they're what you would expect i mean they're all that that's the five main variables that that you can um look at things through but if you were to add a conditional so if so we want to say if whatever is in parentheses here um if whatever is in parentheses is true like that's that's what the if statement does so if that's true then and then we tell it something to do um so then what the output is going to be is since we know that the output down here is a one or a zero and we want it to be something up here we'll just make the output 
high, right? So that's going to be it's like at the at the top of every single candle that it that it indicates it will um, it should plot there. Um, but every you'll notice that this says an else block expected. So you also have to have an else. Um, so else, uh, what I like to do with this is double dot not a number. So what this is is um, you don't have to. <coughs> use this for really anything else. It's a placeholder where it's not zero because we have a zero on the chart, but we only want to show things that are, uh, we only want to show things that actually match and not have it go back down to zero every single time because that would be kind of annoying. Um, so this this is like a zero that doesn't exist. It's it's like um, uh, it's like another number that that is just sort of non-existence, not zero, it's nothing. Um, and that's like double is is just a, a reference to the size of it in memory. So like none of this needs to really make sense. You just have to remember that this is a non-number. And and every time you see that, it's it's basically just saying this is a non-number, um, which is kind of confusing for non-programmers. But if you you know if you want to mute uh, responses, this is the way to do it. Um, so once you once you do that, you can hit apply, and then you can see. That it it now it only draws this line from here to here because in only these two bars does the open and close uh, is it greater than than this uh, three percent, um, which is great. I mean now we now we have an indicator and we have this uh, open close um, uh, we have this this plot set so we could copy this over um, and make a make a scan out of it. But this actually isn't all that interesting of a scan yet because if we want to make it. Um, useful, we're going to need to give it a, a few more parameters. Um, so one of the one of the cool things about this is that you can create more uh, variables, which will let you access um, these numbers in a in a more um, uh, a straightforward way. So it's a little less confusing. Um, and the way that you create a variable is with with this keyword def, and that means define. And I, and I think that in trader in trader view, you may be able to just create it directly. I don't know that it, it forces you to use this def keyword first. But what def is saying is, I want to create a variable, um, and my variable is going to be um, you know pop. You can name it whatever you want; it doesn't really matter. Def pop equals. Um, and the cool thing is now what we can do is just take this entire if statement and call it pop. And then just put that pop up here. So now we have, and you have to remember your semicolon because otherwise it won't work. Um, so we've created we've created a variable named pop, set it to that same value, and then now we can just reference that value later. So anytime you see this, and it, it'll highlight it for you, um, you know that you can just say, okay, whatever this is, that's that's what we're gonna put in here, which makes it a lot easier for you to to add more variables if you want to, because then you can add a variable like um, def percent equals uh, 0.03. So if you want to change this later, you can always set this to something else. And then at the top, it's just, you know, now it's now it's separate as a variable. So we can do other cool things with it later um, or reference it later in different places. And if you want to change it, you only have to change it in one place to change it everywhere else it's referenced. Um, so this, this is kind of cool and all, um, but what I want to see is when um, maybe when when like a volume average is is uh, the, the volume is above average, so we need to add a couple more variables or a couple more conditions here. So we have this condition, which is is cool, but let's add another condition using this um, double ampersand, which means and. It's the same thing as typing in and, um, which also works. You can just type in and. Um, so volume is uh, greater than uh, the average volume. Um, which average is one of those, this is one of these uh, tech analysis uh, functions that's built in. So it's going to give me an average of volume, which, what does that mean? I mean, the average of the volume is great, but how does, what's that calculation actually doing? Um, so if you look down at the, at the bottom of, of this, where it uh, shows you, I can pull it up. Um, so when you click on average, it'll it'll tell you what it's what it's doing here. It's it's looking for the data, which is volume in this case, and then a length. Um, and the default value is twelve. So the length. This is where the the concept of how this programming works is. Um, it, it, this this is the same in every trading platform. Um, when whenever you see one of these variables like volume, 
Um, the, the tricky thing here is that it's not really just a variable. Like if you don't reference any anything else, you just say close, then yeah, I mean, probably what it means is, is it's the close of the current candle. But in, it's also at the same time, it's a it's an array, it's a list of every candle's volume up to this point. Um, so this volume is actually a data set. And this is the same way, and, and you reference an array with brackets, so it's bracket zero. Um, so this is the same thing as just saying volume when you're referencing it directly, but this bracket tells it th that it's an array and you're referencing it with a number, which is the address of whatever variable, whatever um, value you want, like where, where it is in that array. So what that means is um, like volume zero and it's and it goes from zero, starts at zero and goes uh, backwards in time. So when you're on your, when you're on your, uh, uh, candles here, the, the very latest one is going to be zero. And if you put a one, it's going to be the one previous to it and, and so on. So that's true of anywhere within that, that range, but it's, you, you can think of this volume as both, you know, either the current it's it, context based. So either it's the current volume at zero or it's the, the, the whole data set average. And since this is, you know, default 12, you don't have to put that in there, but you could say comma 30. So this is over the last 30 candles of volume. So we're gonna average 30 candles worth of volume here. And we're gonna, and we're looking for the volume, the current volume, which is, you know, volume zero, which you don't have to use, but it is easier to remember when you're dealing with a single candles variable versus an entire data set um, that it will, uh, this volume will be higher. We're looking for a true false here where it's higher than the average volume of the last 30 bars. Um, so does that make sense? I mean, I think that this is uh, really, really complicated stuff. And I know I talked too quick, so I just want to make sure that I can answer, stop and answer whatever questions you guys have along the way. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, does it define a timeline? So last 30 bars on what chart? It's whatever chart you're currently on. Um, so if this is a five minute chart, then it's five minutes. So each bar is five minutes. Um, so, so if you change it, then that automatically changes the, the numbers here to reflect that. So if it's a one minute, then it's the last 30 minutes. If it's a five minute, then it's the last, you know, whatever, 30, uh, 60 hour. No, five times 30 minutes, two hours. Um, I'm not great at math, but I am very good at writing equations to give me the answers. So, all right. The, so now we have a, we're looking for a, uh, a volume that's greater than the average volume, which, you know, hopefully those will be. So we'll hit apply and it should automatically update it at that point. You don't have to close out of this. So, so it makes it very easy for us to, to dig through. But we already knew that these were above average volume anyway. Um, so let's do, you know, average volume uh, times, which is an asterisk. So for, for non-programmers, um, times is an asterisk, slash is divide, um, and plus and minus, which is plus and minus. So we're gonna go like times uh, two or something like that. So twice the average volume. So now any candle where the volume is twice the average volume, we want it to, to show up, which it also does here, which is great. This is not as good of an example. Um, and, I, and I do wanna do, uh, just real quick, this is not gonna be on the test. Um, but one of the things I like to do is set a painting strategy, which is how this line looks. So right now it's just a straight line connecting things. But what you can do with the, the painting strategy, which is also in, um, it's in one of these things on the left here. I think it's in look and feel. Um, you can set what that line looks like. So you can set color. Like right now it's just defaulting to cyan, just because that's what the, the first plot will, will always default to. Um, but th this is nice because it lets you um, use things like points, which for us is going to look better in our final chart. So it's not a line connecting them. It's just putting dots. So this one suddenly pops in. So you now see the, the disadvantage of using a line is that if you only have one isolated example of it, the line won't show up. Um, and that's kind of a drawback for indicators when you're doing it like this because you want to see every instance of it. So here's a hidden one that was there. It was returning correctly, but it wasn't drawing a line because we weren't telling it to draw a line. Um, but now that we've told it to draw points, suddenly it shows up, which you know, it's nice. Tells us 
how it works. Um, so a lot of my a lot of my indicators will do something like this just to make it easier for me to see. Um, but that also then tells us, you know, that we're on the, the right track. So if we if we were to just copy and paste this into a scan with we'd have to change a, a few minor things about the way the, the plot works, um, because it doesn't really care about. Well, actually, we could probably just do it like this. Um, the scan is going to return if this was the current bar, it would return this stock. And that's all there is, you know, for, for a scan, because this is a yes or no question. And it would answer it if it were here. Um, the, the problem with with that is that it's I mean you want to find things that are kind of recent so there's this other uh, this other thing we can add to it where if you say um, within so you can say within 10 bars so within says um, within 10 bars just means that if if this occurs at any point within the last 10 candles and bars is the way it says uh, candles the way it references candles um, then it then it'll also pop up an indicator. So if we add this here, we should have. Um, oh, actually, I guess it doesn't do it on this. That's funny. I really thought that it would add it. I'll have to check why. Um, it's supposed to be adding it here, and I'm not sure what I did wrong. Oh, else double. Uh, I think I know because this is where parentheses are important. So if you add parentheses to the statement and then add within ten bars after it. Um, I think then it should. Oh, and then the problem is that you can't use the reference the the double not a number because, um, yeah, this this within ten bars is a scanning thing. I'm jumping ahead of myself here. Sorry about that. Don't mean to be confusing. Um, so why don't we take this and make it into a scan and see what see what pops out? So we don't care about the painting strategy because a scan doesn't have a painting strategy. We'll just copy this stuff. Um, and then open up our, our scanner. Um, so here's that scanner that we had. And all I'm going to do is go into this, uh, edit, and then paste this into the ThinkScript editor. So the condition wizard is not really all that useful. Um, but in here, we can uh, just drop this in instead of instead of saying um, th this if statement, we we really only need to do the the pop. So all we really need is is to plot this this yes or no question because what a, what a scan wants is just a one or a zero, yes or no, is this true or false? Um, so when we plot data equals pop, then it will give us whatever you know. So this is our our size. So anything that's three percent that has a volume greater than two times the average. There's better ways to do this, but maybe we'll get into it later if we have time. So when you hit OK and then hit Scan, so we're scanning on the 10 minute. Um, and this EXT means extended hours. Um, one of the things that, that uh, you know, Brady and, and Rodessa don't really talk about, when, when, you're, when you're plotting your, your DRs on a daily chart, that those numbers don't take into account anything after hours or pre-market. So when they flip to the 180 to get better detail, now all of a sudden you're seeing the extended stuff. So you're going to see like, like let's say you had something that ran up to $50 in after hours and then dropped again before open. That's not going to show up on a, on a daily that those daily bars don't, don't have extended hours stuff. So if you go to the 180, now all of a sudden it shows up because this, this extended hours stuff is in there, which is why there's more detail there. Um, so if you uncheck this, then it won't include those extended hours. It'll only include hours between the bells. Um, I usually include extended hours anyway, though, because I don't know why you would want to exclude that. Um, yeah, maybe there's maybe there's reasons. Um, but if we hit scan here, then we only get 76 things. So 76 things show up here. Um, Let's find the let's find the most interesting one. Here's this global poll trusion group, um, which, like most stocks that I trade, I have no idea what they do. Um, but we're going to send that chart over here, and sure enough, there's this huge spike here, which you know looks looks great. You know, I mean, it, it looks like it works. So it's probably um, the the close to the open is definitely you know at least three percent. So we know our scan works, um, but it's showing us an awful lot of extra stuff you know that, that we don't necessarily want and also i mean this is where this within three bars comes in within 10 bars comes in um we don't necessarily want to scan for things that just happened we want to scan for things that happened you know recently so this is where we can add in our within 
you know, 10 bars. So on a 10 minute chart, we're talking about the last 100, 100 minutes. Um, and that'll, that'll, that should give us actually more responses, which we can narrow down later, but we just want to make sure that when we get these responses, we're looking at things that didn't, didn't just alert. Um, so now we have 361. So this is, this is the ones that happened most recently. Um, and we should be able to, from, from here, let's pick one of these and just, just take a look. Um, one of the things that the, the reasons that I use indicators to debug is now you can see them showing up here. So when you, when you run your scan, it's, it, this is sort of like the, the sanity check to make sure that you, you know, you actually did it right. And then if you want to change things, you can, you can set your indicator, copy that code back into the scan and run the scan and that stock should, should alert. So it's kind of a, a you know, a way of back checking back and forth between whatever you're looking at in the chart, um, whatever you're plotting in, in the data and then whatever the scan shows. Um, so at the, at the heart of it, I mean, that's really, that's really all that, uh, scanning is, but then you need to keep adding better things to it. And sometimes, yeah, I mean, the other thing you can do is add a filter here. Um, like if you wanted to add a, a you know, a, a volume check or a price range, um, I'll do that sometimes just because it's easier. And I think this might be a little, um, if there's a way to do it here, this might be a little more optimized than actually writing it in code. Um, but for most of these scans, they're not super time sensitive for me, so I don't really care. Um, but a, a, a lot of what I'll do is add in, um, like uh, price points. So one of the things you can do is is add another condition that's like um, and um, so what you could do is say close is greater. Oops, sorry, close is greater than um, two and close is less than 20, right? So if you only want to restrict yourself to stocks between two and 20. Um, so this, now when we scan this, this should show us um, a, a reduced set here because right now we're getting all kinds of stocks and now we're just getting the ones that are in our price range. So you can see that the, you know, the price range is now what we want. And you can also do that in a, as a condition group. I'm just kind of showing you other things that you can do with these variables within uh, because sometimes you want to do something more complicated, you know, um, but the other way you can write this, and this is kind of cool, is another one of these built in functions is between. So between takes three values, the thing that you're testing it against. And then um, what the range is, so two and 20. Um, and, and I'll often like set these as variables as well, you know, with, well, or I'll have like a price minimum and a price maximum, because when I'm setting up my um, indicators, they'll show up. You can actually set them up to um, just be variables, you know, so you can set it up to whatever you want. Um, so, so right now, this is, this is now, and, and if you put this into an indicator or um, on this stock, if this stock is already within the right price range, it'll, it'll show, but if it's not, then it won't. So this is, this is OTC. Oh yeah, I guess I never, you are right. I never, uh, change that to exclude OTC. Um, but this, this stock won't show up. These won't, these won't, um, these indicators won't show up in this uh, study if I were to add this uh, between on here. So that's between close two and 20. Um, uh, and, and that's something that I do a lot with these indicators is I'll, I'll write the scanner using the indicator and then go back and then pull in, um, you know, change the inputs on uh, the, the study to be able to sort of refine what I'm looking at, um, which is pretty easy to do. So if somebody were to like hand you a, a, like one of like my upgapper stock. So at this point now you should be able to take any um, scan queries that, that you get that are, that are not locked um, and you can open it up. So here's my 5% pops within three bars scanner. Um, so what I've said here is I, I set the volume up here only because um, this weeds out all of the garbage. There's a lot of garbage stocks out there that don't move at all. Um, and this is an easy way to filter those out. Uh, this one has this 5% this on here, and I'm not sure why that's on there. It's not really necessary because I have that within, um, within here itself. Um, so here, here I've got my price min, price max. This is kind of older. I should just do this between. That'll be the same thing. Um, volume is greater than the minimum volume, which here is set to 50,000, but for a 10 minute, I think we're gonna make it a little less. Um, 
then this is the, the cooler way of doing it. So I don't know if you guys have ever used um, RCB's enhanced volume scanner, um, but I dug into that when, when I got it from him and it uses this uh, relative volume standard deviations calculation, um, which I've started using for a lot of stuff because it's cooler than an average. It actually uses an SMA of whatever it is that you're calculating it against. Um, and then it'll, um, well, I mean, for, for, for this, it's baked into the volume. So it's using the, the volume against a standard, um, the standard deviation of a volume against an SMA length that you pick. So for this, I, I like the 20 SMA um, because it it's not as, um, it, it's a little more responsive. It gives me a little more, uh, a few more hits than, uh, you know, a 60 would give you just because of the way the, the action works um, in the range of stocks that we're using. Um, and then I use two standard deviations. So a standard deviation is, is um, I, kind of what it boils down to is like how, how, um, how much does this diverge? And then it, it uses that. So if it diverges like one, like a, a one would just be like, you know, not very much. Two is a lot, but some of these really, really big spikes are six or seven standard deviations from, from the average. And when it calculates this, the important thing to remember is that it's always calculating it from the candle it's on. Um, so when it's in a scanner, it's going to calculate it from the latest, you know, on, on every candle. And then it, it'll use the, the, SMA is going to be looking backwards. So just like a, an SMA that you would expect, it's it's from that candle backwards. So the last um, SMA length, 20. So the last 20 candles, it's going to look at our volume of the last 20 candles and say, is this, um, you know, what's the, what are the standard deviations from the previous 20 candles? Um, if you wanted, if you wanted to get this RVSD, um, so it didn't like, let's say there was a huge spike, and then you wanted to see if the, the candle after that had um, you know, it, now all of a sudden this candle is included in that RVSD. One of the things you can do is, um, oh yeah, okay, despicable me. I, uh, so the standard deviation includes 68% of the data. Um, so two is 95% of the data, which is, you know, it gives you a lot of um, spike information um, with two then. Uh, but if you want it to be fuzzier, then yeah, one would, one would work. Um, but one of the things you can do with this, if you want to, to check, like one of the conditions you can say, um, if you want to look for um, something that is in a, in a previous candle or skip the, the current candle, you can do this, uh, which is the, the one, right? So this is, um, this one is, is referencing the previous candle like before the current one. So if you're looking at, at um, and you would never do this in this case, but if you want to look at something that's before, like one of the things I do for, for um, peak testing is looking at the average for the previous candles. Um, and anytime you create a variable of your own, like, so I'm defining something as a variable here, um, all of those are automatically arrays too, just like these are. So you can say, um, scan for poppers, uh, one. So this poppers is like, so now this is the indicator, right? But what, what our scan is looking for is the one that's just previous to that. So right before the spike, you can add more conditions at this point. So scan for poppers one where volume. So now what we're talking about in this case is we're, we're talking about something that, that had a spike in the last candle. And now we're going to add more conditions where volume is greater than or where RSVD is whatever. Um, so you can actually, you know, I mean, you can, it's additive. And actually, I think where is the wrong syntax there? Um, it would be and. So, you know, I mean, you can just, you can keep adding things together and, and get more refined by using these arrays um, with the understanding that you're looking backwards. One of the other cool things you can do with the arrays is look forwards by making it a negative number. So now what I'm looking for is anytime there's a spike, we're looking for the candle right after the spike. So rather than going, um, you know, as numbers increment in the array, they are moving backwards in time. So if you use negative numbers, it's going forwards in time. And a lot of what you can use that for is like, if you want to do peak testing, for example, um, you know, just saying, give me everything that is the, the like highest 
because that's one of the things you can do is is um, highest, which is a built in function. Um, highest uh, high. And let's say in the last 20 bars, so if you say give me uh oh we got a late timer um, if you if you have uh, if you want to scan for the highest high in the last 20 bars. Um, and let's take out the last 10 bars just so we can um, actually, I don't even want to do this here. Let me cancel out of this for a sec. Um, I'm going to go into my indicator. And this is why I like to, to jump back and forth between the indicators is uh, because as you're um, as you're doing this, you, it makes it a lot easier to sort of visualize what the scan is doing, which is why it's important to, to you know, debug it on an indicator because then you can see what it's doing. Um, so if you wanted to say, um, what is what is pop? Yeah, so we instead we'll just we'll just hijack our our scan. So if highest high um, in thirty bars. So if the if if this is the highest high in thirty bars, then then alert. Um, so the last in the last thirty bars, we want to see the highest high. So the the problem with this is that it's only it's only backwards looking. Um, and actually, that didn't work because. Yeah, that's a number, but what we want is for the high to equal that. So if our current high equals the highest high in the last 30 bars, then we're going to mark it at the high point, um, which should give us fewer. Yeah, so it gives us, but it, I mean, the problem here is that's, yeah, it's, it's giving us the latest at every point, um, but it, because it doesn't look backwards, the, the problem is that it's not really giving us a peak. It's just giving us whatever is the highest up to that point. And because it calculates them sequentially from left to right, it's giving us all of them up to here, which is, is kind of pointless. You know? So if you want to do a peak, what you have to do is it's, it's not just that the highest um, high of the last 30 bars, but you also want the highest um, high of the negative 30 for the next 30 bars. So the negative 30, um, if you'll recall, it's not a positive number. So the negative is sending it to the to the to the right side. So from whatever candle you're on, it's going to send you over to the, you know, it, it's going to look to the right rather than to the left, because these these arrays increment leftward um, and the negative numbers increment to the right. And again, zero is what, you know the current candle we're on. Um, so if we want the highest high of both directions. So now, now we're, we're doing like a true peak test, right? So we, we've done a negative lookup against the same range. Um, and and what, what this lets us do is it lets us say, um, in in both directions, so hopefully we'll only see one um, one show up. And actually, I have to get out of this so I can pull it down. It's behind my other indicator. Um, and it didn't alert this one, which is because it's looking thirty in advance, and it's it's failing because it's it's giving it not a not a number so you have to test for this separately when it's within the first 30 candles um, but you can see like if you scroll back this is definitely actually i'm in the wrong chart here i think this is a five minute wow this is slow i wonder what's happening with my computer this is ridiculous um i don't think the parentheses are are missing it should be there we go um, so this is looking for if the peak is the highest within the last 30 bars, um, which it's finding here, you know, so within within this 30 bars, it's finding the peaks, which is what we want to see. Um, yeah, so I mean, that's that's kind of the, the basis of a, of a peak indicator. But a lot of times when I do averages, um, one of the things I want to do is pull out the latest candle, because like, let's say you have a, a pop in your in your uh, current candle. But if you do an average, if you run an average on the current candle, um, so like let's say if equals high, this is um, volume is greater than average volume, right? So if you have something like this, um, of whatever, 30 bars. So 
um, if this volume is is the highest one, if you're like, let's say you're looking for a, a pop, and this is this is an actual like pop statement. Um, one of the things you can do is do the average volume from the previous bar, uh, because again, this volume is a data set, and the data set also includes at one. So you can look for the for the average. Well, actually, what you would do here is not put it in here, but you could you could set um, average, right? So you define an average. And then you'd create your average as uh, this, which is right. So this is average. So now we've got um, we've got an average of the last thirty candles volume. So now we want to say if the current volume is greater than the average, which it, if it is, then you know if, if it's a spike, then then great. But what we want is to exclude the current volume from the average. Then we take the average of one. So again, every variable you create is secretly also a list of, it's an array of all of the variables up to that point as well. Um, so if you were to just say average, that would be the same thing as saying average zero. But if you say average one, then you're actually going back to the previous candle and getting the average from that candle. So you can do cool things like, you know, from the average of 10 candles ago or, um, you know, whatever. I mean, there's, there's another variable here that's um, bar number, which is, in the total grand scheme of things, like what bar number is this? And the bar number changes based on the time scale because the first, like bar number one is gonna be the furthest left candle on, on the chart. Um, and, and this doesn't really work for scans as much. I think, I think it does, but I, I'm not sure where the cutoff is for those, whether it's all like max data or what. Um, but you can find out the bar number and then if you, you can like do tests against, against the current bar number because um, one of the things you can't do is is grab let, let's use a, a variable for this this is going to fail um, and it'll tell you lonely constants expected here so you can't use a variable to go look up an array you have to do it in a, in a different way so you know the, the way you'd have to do that is to look up the bar number uh, that you want um, and then do a get value so um, oops, oh, that's the problem with auto completion. So we've again, def created a, a variable, and then we're going to take it against the, um, we're going to take it against, uh, whatever the bar number was of the, like, you know, let's say you, you figure out which, which bar number it's in. Um, then you can say, get the value of close and then get the, you know, whatever the bar number was of that, like, so, uh, you know, the 10th tenth, tenth one previous or whatever. So this way you can, you can actually get a value at a variable, um, a, at a variable index number, um, which is sometimes handy to do. So uh, anyway, so this is, this is like really, again, really complicated. Um, are, are there, do you guys have any questions at this point of things that I, that I haven't touched on yet, like that you might want to, have me expand on because again i mean your scans don't have to be complicated they can be just as simple as you know show me the close value um when it's greater than x or or whatever i mean like a lot of a lot of my studies are really just that i mean the, the i think the upgapper one which i i set to um back to my scans the one of the ones i use constantly is um this Uh, overnight upgapper scan, um, which is really handy because it's it's. I mean, this is really just like a volume gate, so that it says, um, "Don't give me garbage stocks." Where the last, um, which is not a built-in variable, but it's something you can use on a stock screen, um, where it's between two and fifty bucks. And then I have my custom scan here, and it goes um, on the four hour in extended time. So what it what it really does, and and you'll see down in here, it looks at the last four bars of the four hour, which is is overnight if you're near the bell. Um, which is kind of neat. Uh, the uh, yeah, so the the end end goal for the scanner that's a really good way of putting it. Like, what are, what is it you're trying to accomplish? Um, and and that is usually what you start with. You know, where where like when I built the mid candle scanner that I'm still toying with, one of the things I wanted to try to do was automate that process of drawing those fibs. Um, so on a five minute chart, I'll look for peaks and troughs, and then um, draw draw the, the the mid candle halfway up and once you have the, um, you know, once you have that data set, then it's it's pretty cool to to set that as a scanner. Like so, I have it as an indicator, but it's also set up as a scanner 
that will tell me when that condition hits on things that have been running for a while, and then I'll go look at them and see where the, the mid candles in relation. Um, so I uh, Doc had a question if it's possible to reference external data because it doesn't have float, which it it can't. Um, and that's a huge downside because float would be really handy to get for what we're doing um, in our little niche um, in small caps and, and runners um, like Momo is is all about float. Um, and there's just no way to do that. You can get like market cap, which doesn't really tell you anything, um, but it, it, they don't have float data um, in there. What you what you can do if like you can manually code it, which is um, crappy. But one of the things you can do is create a variable def um, you know has low float, and then you know you can you can create an array here. Like it's just a, a basically a long condition if um you know get symbol equals oh no i screwed that up if get symbol equals um you know you know some low float whatever the the ticker number is um and, and actually you wouldn't even need the if in this case because Um, because what we're doing is, oh my God, so many typos. Um, what we're doing is creating a true or false statement. Is is this has low flow? So get symbol will return the current symbol you're on, um, but then you would have to like manually hard code all of them. So there's just no good way to do it. And I would love it if they would open that up um, or at least put float data on there. But float data is one of those things that it seems like everybody has a different answer for it. So however they're compiling that data, there's not really a centralized source, which is, you know, silly uh, but yeah i mean basically you'd have to hard code it which is i mean so far i haven't really done and, and what i do is um actually you know what the way you do it you would um create a watch list a manual watch list of low float tickers and then um just intersect it you know just i mean that's that's how you'd set it up you you wouldn't have to like hard code it in the in the code at all you would just set it up as um, you know, as a as a, a watch list, and then scan against that. So, like tray breakout watches would be a great one to use because I think most of those are already low float anyway, um, and that that would be the easiest way to do it. I think. Yeah. So, I mean, anytime you have like a, a list of of like good Momo tickers as a as a watch list, it's handy to have those as watch lists just for this reason, um, because then you can sort of focus. I mean, the problem is with that is you're going to miss stuff that that like the edge cases where like how are you defining low flow i mean are you going to be strict like brady and it's going to be like under 20 or 50 or whatever his his is or i mean is it going to be like 60 or 70 because those can still move um so i i tend to not really worry about that as much just because that'd be you know it, it would be cool to know though i mean i guess that that that's maybe something i should look into is is grabbing one of those momo watch lists and intersecting against that because that's already got everything on it that I want, and 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 I wouldn't have to do things like exclude based on um, price action anymore, like the price, like minimum, maximum, because that's also pretty limiting. I mean, if you have something like AMC, which has a history of going bonkers, then I mean, it might be nice to have it on there, but it's at sixty bucks, you know, or, or forty or whatever it's at right now. So I mean, it wouldn't show up on the scan necessarily. Um, so that actually is a really good idea. I'm gonna have to start doing that. Um, let me see if there's anything else on my list that I haven't gone through. No, I think that's about that's about it. I mean, the the other thing you can do with um, uh, indicators that's cool because when you're digging through these, it's nice to be able to um, set them up as as uh, interactive. So what 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 you can do is instead of having this uh, def, you can use input which is like def, it's like I'm creating a variable, but the input makes it automatically um, create it as a uh, um, something you can modify in here. So if you're writing a script for other people, now all of a sudden you see my variable here is, you know, I can change it on the fly, which is pretty cool. I mean, at this point now, like if you want it to be like 0 0.05, then you can set it like that. Or if you want to um, have, have pieces of your variables be uh actually it's not going to show up on this because this is the right scanner so i haven't actually written you a, a scanner or an indicator that works yet but hopefully the goal was to uh show you how to do it so that you'd be able to 
set it up yourselves. So yeah, but I mean, I think that that like the, the some of the cool things I think that I've been doing with with this, um, I, I I had created. Um, well, actually, this isn't this isn't it. The mid candle scanner is pretty neat, but it's complicated and it does weird things. Um, but this one, this one is is what colors the the candles on my on um, my chart. Not all my charts, just my main chart. Um, but it colors it using VPA, which is um, if something is has this is a terrible chart to look at it on. Um, let's find something that's got a little bit more variation to it. So the idea behind this, um, and, I, and I have it set up so that it's for both um, the, uh, I, I have a, a volume script for the for the volume indicators and I have a one for the, the um, tickers themselves. And this this just sets it up so that that it, it checks the wicks and it checks the open and close. And it says, is this particular wick or open and close, um, like how how bullish or how bearish based on percentages. So like if you have something like this this candle up here, which yeah it's it starts out bearish anyway. It's got a little bit of a lower wick, but it's got a really big upper wick. So it takes the percentage of the close, which is way down here, and the high, and that tells you how much red to make it. And then it'll take the low to the close, and tell you how much green to make it. So from here, the low to the close, there's not much green at all. So this candle is really red. I mean, this candle is really red, uh, but you can see this one, this one's got more of a lower wick. So it's not actually, I mean, it, yeah, it would be a red candle for everybody else. But for me, this isn't that bad of a candle because the lower and upper wicks are, are balancing themselves to a point where it's brown. Whereas like this one is orange because, um, you know, it's got a much bigger body than it does wick. So it's actually closer to the red. Um, but then you have other candles like these, like some of these green ones, that are, I mean, yeah, they're green, but like, how green are they? You know, they're not that great. Um, they're not like the super greens, um, you know, and, and that's the sort of thing that helps me really um, solidify the, like the VPA stuff that, that Brady talks about is, is being able to see it dynamically in the, in the chart colors. But the other thing I have is this relative volume standard deviations um, that I adapted to make those colors brighter if their um, standard deviations are higher. And in the candles, I actually have it set to be more transparent if the volume is lower. So the lower volume pullbacks are going to be darker, whatever color they are, just because there's not a lot of volume associated with them. And then the more volume you have, the brighter the candles are. Um, so that just sort of incorporates all of the data into um, I mean, I wouldn't trade without my volume underneath, but I mean, I definitely you can you can see when there's volume and when there's not. I mean, this low volume pullback, yeah, it's green, but it's it's you know that's low volume right there. Um, so you really don't have to worry about this stuff as much. Um, which you know, I don't know. I think for for training wheels on VPA, I think it's kind of handy, um, but it definitely works in the in the volume to be able to see like which like at a glance like what what volume candles are important and which ones aren't. Um, and all of that is just, I mean, it's the same stuff, you know, and you can even make indicators based. And I do have, I mean, I actually have um, scanners that that look for these spikes and then put them into a watch list. And and I, some people were um, talking about uh, some of the, some of my scanners returning a lot of stocks, which um, I did that uh, on purpose on some of them because like on my top gainers list, I want that to be as big as possible so that the stocks that we care about are already in the list because um, the problem with with thinkorswim is that when you tell it to like let's say you have a scanner running um, and, and it's it's a it's a watch list scanner and you say add um, you know add stuff to this list dynamically whatever uh, because it's a it's an ongoing scan it runs every whatever three minutes maybe and you know less depending on how how much load their servers have but if you make that scan more expansive to include more stuff then like Trey's watch list, you'll be able to catch those things faster and sometimes faster than trade ideas would because the, the stocks are already on the list. They just pop to the top when you sort them as, as mark um, percentage. And that makes it a lot easier to identify things that are rising quickly because they're already on your list. So like Trey has spent all that time like curating his list. And, and what I wanna do is get to a point where I can, um, I can use my scanners as those lists and then they just pop to the top automatically and that I'm seeing those things. And it does pick up stuff that like, I mean, the, the, the downside of a curated watch list is, yeah, I mean, you can put like typical Momo tickers on there, but nobody was catching GOED right before that thing popped. And it showed up on, on my 
uh, overnight upcappers list because I because it's dynamic. I mean, it shows up. It's just based on price and the price action put it on the list for some reason. I think somebody I don't know if anybody banked on it, but like they noted it and they were like, hey, this is something to watch. And I was like, why would you look at that? That's a dumb stock. Oh, my God, what happened? You know, so that sort of thing is kind of neat to see when the when the scanners pull out random stuff like that. Um, so anyway, well, it's been an hour. And if anybody has any other questions about about it, um, it's I, I can um, maybe do another session at some point if if people have like specific questions or a specific kind of scanner that you want to walk through making um, because like it, it's always nice to have examples to work from. I mean, the stuff I've shown you today is pretty pointless um, because there are better ways to get you know percentage pop scanners and. I just kind of wanted to show you how to use the uh, the the system, you know, how to get into to scans yourself, um, because that's that's really the the biggest part of it is being able to like, um, you know, pop into a, a a thing here, you know, if somebody sent you a, a like if you get one of my scanners, you'll be able to edit all of these things directly yourself. You'll be able to change all of these things and and toy with it, play with it, you know. I mean, just decide, you know, what sorts of variables you want to change. Um, so the question is, do we have a consensus of what would groups of trade ideas we'd have? And do we have a corresponding scanner for these groups? Like, um, yeah, I mean, it's this is the sort of thing where I think that you can take these ideas that I've got in my scanners and use them as a springboard for all of that stuff. Because I've got, you know, I've got a top gainers list. I've got a grinders list. I, wonder what, I should probably jump into that and show you it real quick. Um, the, the grinders are interesting. The way I set that up, um, I have like a hard mode on a lot of these things, but I also have other ones that are that are kind of more more straightforward. So let's just scan real quick. I like to scan before I edit just to see what's on there. So XERS and CLNE are, are hitting right now as as um, uh, grinders. So the, the way the grinders work is that um, over the last two bars, I want to see stuff where the body height um, is greater than a you know the the standard deviations. Um, are greater than two, and the body height is greater than uh, the day before. So it's it's, and you can see I've commented out a bunch of other things. Like these are the things where I've been testing. Like they have a built-in is ascending, um, where it takes any variable, and then whether or not it's, um, you know, you take whatever variable you want, and whether it's ascending over that range. So all the built-in functions work more or less the same. You give it the data set, and you give it the range. Um, and, and it'll default. I think the range generally defaults to 12 for whatever reason. Um, but the is ascending stuff is only, I mean, it's literally like, is this bigger than the one before it? And you can do that yourself. And then you can do other cool things like add in percent. So it's not just, you know, so I have this high growth, like is the body height um, divided by the top greater than a certain percentage, um, which is, you know, it's going to tell you like, uh, it's kind of like a percent pop on the daily. So if you run this scan on a, on a daily, then it's like, is it bigger than than whatever? I think it's 0.5. Um, so if we run this against, uh, let's go look at CLNE, because I know I know Rodessa was on this, uh, or was it Brady was on it as a swing, I think. Um, but then, so this thing this thing alerted as being one of the, the grinders. And if we look at the, at the daily, um, it definitely is. Like you can see, these bodies are are big. You know, they're they're much bigger than their predecessors. So um, this one is is on the red. So this is one of those ones where you look at it and you'd have to make a judgment call. Like this looks pretty bearish to me. So I don't know that I'm going to be jumping on this grinder. Um, but the other one was uh, what was it XERS? Um, this one is this one. Show, oh no, I'm thinking of XLRS. No, XERS. This is the one. This had shown up yesterday. People were talking about it, but this is why I like the grinder scan because it will show you cool stuff like that, where you can like decide if you want to. Um, uh, these these ones aren't as good of grinders, but it's it's nice to have them in a list because when new ones alert, then um, you know you can go check out their daily and start you know managing that stuff. Um, yeah, so, and again, all of these scripts are, should be in the, in our, in our discord at the, at the Brady Bunch, um, scripts channel and they're, some of them I've posted to Atlas, but I don't have enough, uh, juice there to get them posted anywhere useful on, um, for any amount of time. Um, so I'm gonna, 
see see if I can talk to to somebody about posting them there if people are interested. I think the the top gainers scan is pretty cool because every morning I'll go look at the trade ideas. Um, there's that Precision Trades Trade Ideas YouTube video that that RCB keeps referencing, um, and then I'll check that and make sure that that all at least all of my top gainers are on that. Even if I have more, I'm okay with that. I'd rather have more than than fewer. So. Um, you know, that's, and that was mostly because I just didn't want to pay hundred bucks a month for trade ideas. I mean, that was kind of spendy for something that I, I, I mean, if I can write a, you know, toss scan for that, then I'll do that instead. Um, or just go to, you know, the YouTube channel, but I like having it on there because it does funky things during the day too, because it looks for the last eight hour period. Um, that's my top gainers. Like the top gainers are going to be from, before, like, usually I look at it before the bell, um, to, to see the up gappers from overnight, but that's really all they are. They're like overnight, Gainer. So it's just a different kind of view into it. So when you look at it later in the day, those can change. Um, yeah, and, and if that's true. The $100 a month isn't a lot right now. But I found also like part of the problem, I kept getting a lot of FOMO because I'd hear all of these hits on various things that were popping and I'd want to go run and, you know, slap the ask and, and that's, I can't, I can't trade that way. You know, I mean, it's just, it, it ended up with me, um, just FOMOing myself into a lot of bad trades. So hopefully someday when I get a lot better at managing my um, emotions, I'll be able to um, calmly and, and rationally slap the ask like Trogdor, but I'm not, I'm not anywhere near that yet. Um, anyway, so, all right, I guess I'm going to, I'm going to sign off on, on this one. And I'll post it up on YouTube because I know there were a bunch of people who couldn't make it. Um, and then I guess if you see me around and you guys have any more questions, then, you know, hit me up and I'm always available to hand out, uh, scripts if you're, if you're curious or if you don't have the links. So cool. Well, I hope everybody got, got something out of it and, um, uh, you know, keep, keep paying it forward. So, all right. Now I have to figure out how to quit the stream. There we go. <laughs> All right. I will, uh, I'll talk to everybody online.